Hi everyone, as Chris mentioned, um, I'm just up here in Mountain View, and we have a lab that we work to prototype different concepts for human machine interfaces in the car. And uh, let's get started. So the three things I want to try covering today's uh, presentation is I want to discuss what the opportunity is for augmented reality in cars. And um, what are the design issues, both on the cognitive level of the driver and perceptual, what they're seeing? And um, how to create content for automotive AR, at least the way we've currently tried to figure it out. Um, our group's mission statement is really to explore enriching the driver's experience. So we really put the driver as the central user, front and center. And this is the, the work I'll be showing is with my team here. It's a pretty modest size of four people. We're multidisciplinary, computer scientists, interaction designers, mechanical designers, and myself. And um, what we're working on is a 3D HUD. It's a heads-up display that you can actually see in 3D, immersive, for augmented reality in the driver's field of view. And I'm gonna talk about our journey of how we kind of made our decisions to get to that stage and why we're doing it this way. Um, there are really a couple of challenges that are happening. It's a very interesting time in the automotive industry in that you have a lot of new technologies coming on board, both in terms of sensors, in terms of internet access, in terms of new uh, modalities for interaction with gesture, speech. At the same time, uh, demographically, we've got some interesting demographics. We've got a lot of uh, youngsters now that want all their um, smartphone technologies, all their connectivity in the car, want to stay constantly connected. And you also have a growing elderly population that wants to stay as long as possible in terms of using their car and retain their mobility. So we, we want to really consider that marriage of technology and um, the people's situation to figure out what's the best way to help solve some of the problems they have. Now, what the industry is also happening is he's kind of seeing this two major strategies in technology. On one hand, we've seen stuff like Google and almost every major auto manufacturer is now working on autonomous vehicles. And we also see the ideal of an enhanced driver. So you're still behind the wheel controlling the car, but you've got a lot of extra information um, for example, there's a field called ADAS, which is Advanced Driving Assist Systems, and how they can try to make people drive safer. Uh, so let's just kind of quickly go over the, the different arguments for the two. Um, for the autonomous driving people, the main concern is that we know that most accidents are caused by people's own uh, behavior. Um, in fact, well, this is an old study from 79, but they showed about 93% of all accidents have some kind of human factor involved. So the ar argument with the autonomous driving people is that if you can kind of get that out of the equation, you, you actually reduce quite a lot of accidents. Um, at the same time, it's, it's, it's safer and, uh, add, and probably uh, with current technology now, the, the, in the more modern times, it's more likely you get about 70% of accidents are caused by driver distraction as well. So that's also a big major human factor. Um, on the flip side though, I've, if you read them, um, some of you may know Donald Norman. He's a, big usability expert and designer, and he talks about what we might need is not, uh, we need more augmentation, not automation. And the reason is that if you see, picture yourself sitting behind an autonomous vehicle, you really need to have a trust in what that vehicle is doing, how it's making its decisions, what it's capable of seeing. So you need to have a way of communicating that information to the driver or the passenger now. So we really want to, we can use augmentation to do that, as well as to help the same technologies can also be used to help make better and safer uh, driving aids. Um, you know, we've, we've seen the mobile device with smartphones and tablets, how they're connected and portable. But really, the car is the ultimate mobility device. It's got all the same features, but some really unique uh, things that make it more robust. You can have a lot more expensive uh, computation and sensors on the vehicle. And you have this unique capability in which you're not just looking at the world through a small display but you're looking out through your regular windshield at the world outside. Uh, we're talking like see-through display versus AR over video. So just a quick reality check on how I'm defining augmented reality. It's basically when you're looking at the world, either live or direct or indirect, at the physical real world and having elements of that world augmented with uh, computer graphics or audio or, or other information that could be um, obtained from the world. This is not, it's, I want to distinguish that from heads-up displays where you, 
There are heads-up displays in cars now, but they basically show stuff like the speedometer, the speed, maybe some map information, but it's not really related directly to what you're seeing outside your windshield. Um, our, our lab, we started this project about a, a couple, two years ago now, and um, what we call this, it's called HiCar, where it's Honda Integrated Contextual Augmented Reality. So we're trying to use augmented reality in context with the world outside. And I'll give you an example, like uh, this is Santana Row in San Jose. It's a really nice street if you're new here. And what we want to do is you can augment things directly on the world. So that's, we're not putting it in a small little window at the bottom, but it's actually all over the objects. Or you could, uh, actually one thing we revised was instead of going with that 3D perspective, you can also do other ways of displaying the information to increase re readability for the driver. So it comes down to where's the opportunity here. I, I'm trying to set up the stage that augmented reality can be useful for the car, but there's really two major directions we can take with it. You could take the blue pill, which is having the world assume that you know, the driver, just take a lot of technologies on your smartphone and just transfer it directly to the car. You can have advertisements, you know, select your albums and music <laughs> on your windshield, or you could take the red pill, which is look at the environment outside, try to understand the context, the situation awareness that a driver might have, and see if we can do something to help increase that situation awareness and help offload the cognitive load on a driver. So if you guys know Matrix, you kind of know which way I'm going with this. And I'll, I'll show you more later. Um, let's kind of review the cognitive issues of the driver. So on the left, there's the perception where you, you're seeing everything through your eyes and you're building up situation awareness. And because of that, what that does is that information helps you either set up a good um, kind of like philosophy of driving, like being a defensive driver and have, helping you get the reflexes to drive safely in your environment. Um, at the same time, if, if AR can be used to help enhance that visual stimuli and enhance that situation you're in, I call that good AR. Bad AR is when you put things in the visual field and they actually can cause problems like driver distraction where you're now focusing on things on your screen instead of what's out there in the world or a phenomenon called inattentional blindness where you can have a lot of shiny things and you're basically fixating and looking at that thing and not paying attention to other things in your view that you should be paying attention. When that happens, you can have accidents and dying is a bad user experience. It's, this is something that you really have to think about in this case. It's, it's not like if a smartphone app crashes, <laughs> if it, an app fails there, like you can literally crash. Um, so that's the one big distinction, I guess, of automotive AR over um, the other kinds of AR we've seen around here. So let's talk a bit about what we need to have in this display. It's not going to be the same kind of display you have on your smartphones. It's, it's going to be a see-through display. Um, I talk about uh, this cognitive dissonance problem where your brain has to kind of, if you have too many different things being seen at the same time that are conflicting, your brain has to try to work through that. In this example here, I'm using a fixed size font and in a 2D layer over a 3D world. So your brain would actually have to switch to 2D, read that, and then switch back to 3D. Um, doing simple things like making everything consistent, just the way things are in the real world today where we have signs and roads that are moving in the environment, like augmented reality, you can actually help reduce that cognitive distance and help alleviate the load on, on the person's brain. Another thing I want to point out, and this is kind of like an argument why you shouldn't wear a Google Glass or something like that <laughs> while you're driving, is this dual focus problem. And this is the case where if I'm in, in a car and I'm looking out at a person in focus, and then I throw something up on my display, in my, either on my glass or in a small heads up display in the car, the, object, the text or on that display will be out of focus because your eye is fixating on the distant object. So then what your eye will try to do is you'll fixate then on the target in front of you, and then the object in the back will be blurry. So this is going to cause a lot of perceptual problems. And in fact, for a lot of elderly people, there's a delay to accommodate your eye back and forth between that. What you've got to do instead is develop a display that lets you change the focal plane of what you're displaying to match the targets you're seeing outside. That has two implications. You've got to be able to sense the world, and you also have to be able to move your focal planes to match it. Those are the kind of things we're working on in our lab. And here's a, 
little video kind of showing um, an example of that. This is in our lab with our prototype, and I have these two lanes. And you can see, as I'm moving my camera, which re represents your head, um, as I move it, you can see the lanes moving around uh, relative to those two uh, orange pylons here. And that's, that, if you think of that in the real car, you're going to have a lot of distance problems. Now, in the second example, we can, we can lock the focal planes to the ground plane so that no matter how much I move my camera, you can see the endpoints of those lanes are always sticking onto the pylons. And this is through a see-through display. Uh, and we could do this without having to use head tracking software because we're playing with the optics and actually creating a real image, of, or a virtual image out there beyond the glass in the 3D world with, with things we see. Oops. I'll also talk about, I want to talk about field of view a bit because, um, you know, you often see a lot of these videos on YouTube with all these really beautiful scenes all augmenting the city. But in reality, to get those kind of optics working with a windshield, um, it's really difficult to do a full windshield display like that. Most commercial um, dis heads-up displays right now in cars, like in, in BMWs and so forth, you're going to have a small heads-up display area there. And you can see that it really limits what you can really augment in the driver's field of view. What we're trying to do is build a bigger a display that's capable of a bigger field of view so that we can cover more areas. We still can't cover the whole thing, but there's a lot of things working in our favor. <coughs> Uh, one of those things is that we can see the world uh, in front of us, and we can see far away, and that's what you need to augment. And if things were closer away, closer to you, it would be um, you're more likely to already pass that as you're moving in a car. So where to locate the display? You could, there's many ways you can to put augmented reality displays. Like these are the common ones in the cluster, the center dash, as a heads-up display. Or what we really want to do is try to put it in the driver's field of view where we can augment that information. So let's quickly talk about content here. Um, <clears throat> what we're trying to do in our lab is we're trying not to think too much of the technology first, but what are the needs of the drivers first? So we have this kind of waterfall thing. It's not quite waterfall, but we work on designs first. Then when we develop low-level prototypes, we decide if we want to invest the engineering effort to actually build them into high-fidelity prototypes. And at that point, we can then uh, test them with user evaluation. We do a lot of uh, interviews with uh, drivers and try to get their unique needs and their new personalities. From there, we brainstorm a lot of ideals, a lot of sketches, and then that allows us to create different driving aids. Um, this is just kind of the life cycle of the kind of we do with dri different drive aids, going from low-level sketches all the way to prototypes that we can actually see and experience in a driving simulator. And this is our setup we have in our lab. We have a 120-degree field of view curved screen where we can do immersive driving simulations because we really want to see how drivers behave with these aids. And um, this video just kind of shows you what that looks like. It's, I'm just holding the camera and panning across and you can see we're using a driving simulator software. That's our in-lab prototype here. Um, and we, we are trying to work on an in-car prototype as well, but we really want to test as much as we can in the lab first before we go on the road. And it just shows you, like, once you kind of sit there, you can then see things in the display. So they're on the display and not on the actual screen being projected. Um, these videos are just um, different driving aids that we have worked on in our lab. So uh, on the left is we're playing around with ideas where we can enhance the driver's situation awareness so that they can see the environment all the way around them, as well as on the right, we're looking at different left-hand turn aids so that one thing you could do with augmented reality is project the path of a car three seconds in the future. And that helps people judge the distance and safety, whether they can make a left turn or not. It's actually something a lot of people have difficulty judging, how fast a car is approaching them. So in conclusion, um, I hope I try to convey the message that augmented reality in cars is, has the potential to aid and engage drivers and in a meaningful way, not like uh, you know for marketing or anything like that, but something that can actually improve their driving experience and make them drive safer. Uh, but the flip side is we have to design very carefully for the driver. We've got to design, prototype, test, and iterate. And as well as um, we need to design solutions that collaborate with the drivers and not distract them. Um, and with that, I uh, uh, just want to put my contact information here. Um, 
because we're always looking for interesting people to collaborate with and help create new solutions in our cars. And um, I can turn that over to questions. I'll just play this video while that's going on too. It's just kind of montage of oops, montage of different things we've been doing in the lab. Oh, sure. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> All right, anyway. Okay, can I uh, switch over? Okay, sorry. Okay, Q&A. Question here in the back. <laughs> Question. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, one of the different things in what you really showed today was, well, all the other demos stand about uh, talk about standing at one place and lo looking at a static image and scanning them. Yours is something that is intended to do in motion. Right? Yes. So how do you propose delivering content at say 40 or 60 miles per hour when the car is moving and you have dynamic content coming in front of the screen? So what is the kind of technology you're looking at? Yeah. Um, a lot of it will have to be local on the car. So, uh, for example, the kind of content we're doing is not, most likely not going to be too much things like, there will, it depends on the application. We're, we're looking at driving aids. So for those, everything is quite local in the environment. And so everything has to be sensed from sensors on the car. And then they will be sensed and then uh, viewed on the car as well. So for there, we are looking at more local solutions. Um, some things like location-based um, services we're looking at maybe at least 4G type connectivity to the car so that, and probably a lot of smart pre-caching. The nice thing about the cars though is you, you know you're not gonna like just go off anywhere. You know what route you're gonna be driving on. You can kind of pre-cache parts of your route in, adv in advance um, because there's a finite amount of time to travel from one place to the other. Yeah. Next question. There's a question here. Hi, I'm just curious with the number of um, concepts around augmenting reality and, and having that visual and a heads up or whatever, there has to be a huge amount of liability considerations in this. How, it's, I don't know if that's something you would be dealing with, but yeah. how is Honda looking at liability issues and people taking data off the screen and um, distractions, right. things I, I of that nature? I can kind of tell you in general how automotive industry has been doing it. A lot of times, you know, when you look at your Navi, they'll have some kind of disclaimer <coughs> telling you, you know, you shouldn't be operating this thing in the car and so forth. In this area, I do feel that some of the stuff uh, we'll have to kind of work through. There's a bit of a process for getting it approved in the car, especially some of the concepts we have are actually filling the driver's field of view, which in, like in the EU, for example, they don't want heads up displays uh, filling up the field of view. But the distinction I would make though is that we're trying to show information that's relevant to the driver versus something like the speed that would be blocking their car view. So I think what has to be done is we have to work with organizations like Nishta in the USA. And that's why we're doing these usability studies. We have to kind of show that people can benefit from driving uh, with these devices opposed and compare them what, what it's like with and without and playing around with different configurations. But, uh, yeah. So if there's, is there a case to be made that if you're, uh, if someone's looking for a hotel and they're driving, that it'd be better if the hotel names were appearing as they drive as opposed to just looking back and forth and I, searching? I think there has been research that shows that, yeah, the fact that you don't have to glance away and look at the center dash display and actually see it up there, I think there is, I, I feel there's a benefit for that. Um, what you have to be careful about is how you display. You don't want to have flashing red or something that will just draw their eye away from it too long and, and they forget it. You have to be a bit smart about how you display that, but I, I do feel it's better than a center dash display showing the information instead. If other people have any questions for Victor, um, if you could kind of direct them to them you know, after the session, because we're going to need to move on to the next speaker now. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.